It's recording, Dan, you got it. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. So welcome everybody to RBR's webinar today. My name is Daniel Nelson. I'm a technical sales manager for RBR. I'm based in the west of North America in the Seattle Tacoma area of Washington State. We're pleased to have Mara Arasganen with us from Naval Postgraduate School, um, and she's going to present on her topic on estuaries and um, bar-built uh, beaches and, and the dynamics that happen with beach breaching. So we're going to have that science talk in a little bit. Um, but for the, uh, for the time being, I'm going to speak briefly about some of the instruments that Mara uses in her research, uh, as well as some of the uh, calibration services that are available from RBR uh, to our clients. RBR is a, is, a, is a manufacturer of oceanographic grade instruments that al allow researchers and coastal engineers and other professionals to measure the, the blue planet, as we say, which is the marine environment, uh, the uh, freshwater environment, uh, coastal environment. And so we make a variety of sensors and systems available uh, for those purposes. Um, in terms of sensors, uh, we manufacture a DO sensor, we manufacture uh, temperature, conductivity, and pressure sensors. These are often combined into loggers, which include memory and, and battery power. So as you can see on this photo here, that's a, our RBR Concerto CTD, um, which is, has a dissolved oxygen sensor and a turbidity sensor connected to it. So these are the loggers. Um, we make both standard loggers like you see on the screen, but then also uh, compact loggers, uh, which we're going to talk about in more detail today. Uh, the next, we make systems that help uh, researchers get their data from the bottom of the sea up to the surface, uh, but then also telemetry systems that include Iridium and GSM uh, data connections to servers all around the world. So um, we manufacture sort of the end-to-end -end process for researchers to get their data. We also repackage um, our sensors in a variety of different forms to enable uh, float and glider manufacturers uh, to, to have the best uh, CTD technology available for their products. And so those are our OEM products that we talk about. On this screen, you can see the entire collection or most of our instruments that are available. Um, and there's a, as you can see, there's a wide variety of, of iterations of instruments, accessories available, um, configurations. And so we really encourage um, you to, to browse our website and get uh, or contact us um, to learn more about how we can help your research. Um, I'm just going to go through this briefly here, but uh, today's discussion is going to be about compact loggers, which are the yellow ones at the top center of the screen. Our standard CTD uh, packages are over on the lower right with our RBR Concerto and RBR Maestro. Um, the RBR Maestro can have up to 10 sensor channels connected to it, so you can measure uh, not only CT and D, but you can measure uh, fluorometer, uh, chlorophyll and algae, you can measure turbidity, dissolved oxygen, pH, uh, irradiance, those kinds of things in addition to CTD. Down at the bottom, we have our very high resolution and high accuracy pressure loggers, uh, the quartz series. Uh, these use a DigiQuartz pressure transducer and they're used for very, very accurate um, water level measurements, uh, tsunami monitoring, um, and other geophysical, um, uh, geophysical research topics. And then we, we, as I mentioned earlier, we collaborate with uh, some other manufacturers, including Delmar Oceanographic for the Wirewalker system. We make um, RBR CTDs for Argo floats. And um, I think, and then I think that's about it. So that's the coverage of our products there. Mara, in her research, um, uses the RBR Duet TD, which this is a compact logger. Uh, T stands for temperature, D stands for depth, uh, which uses an absolute pressure sensor. So you can see the pressure sensor and the temperature sensor up on the screen. It's a self-contained instrument, so it has a single AA battery. It has memory, uh, it's configurable, um, and it's, it's about the size that you can see on your screen. It's about the size of a cigar. So it's quite small. The, uh, these are very highly accurate. They're the same accuracy level as our standard instruments. Um, the pressure accuracy is 0.05% of full scale. Uh, and the temperature accuracy uh, is 2 milli degrees C. 
So, and then um, they can last for a long time. So you, on a single AA battery, you can get uh, over 20 million readings. Um, and depending on your sample rate, you can get several months or up to a year of sampling out of this logger. This logger also has a, a wide variety of, of types that you can buy. So you can get fast sampling options. You can get a wave logger, which includes um, some extra firmware and software support to help you do wave statistics following your deployment. In Mara's lab, she also has the RBR Solo Turbidity Logger, um, which is basically a turbidity sensor that has been um, connected to our electronics and our powering system inside the Solo. So um, you can do autonomous uh, turbidity measurements. Um, the, we, we provide uh, nephilometric turbidity units uh, as part of our software program. And so then, then you can look at total suspended solids and others um, if you were to do those calibrations yourself in your lab. I'm sorry for the low resolution of these photos, but um, these are some examples of what this solo turbidity logger looks like uh, in the real world. Often it comes um, bracketed uh, with these red brackets that are supplied by RBR. Um, and the wiper system is the ZebraTech Hydro Wiper. It's a fully autonomous wiper system. It runs on its own AA batteries um, and it allows you to keep the logger in the water for a long period of time uh, and, and um, help prevent biofouling from affecting the readings from the optical sensor. So this is kind of what the complete package looks like for a lot of our clients, which includes the Solo TU logger, the ZebraTech Hydro Wiper. This particular application um, is in British Columbia in Canada, um, the Nature Trust of BC has dozens of these instruments and they're using them uh, to monitor estuaries, river estuaries uh, in the west coast of British Columbia um, after river restoration projects. So we're really happy to support them with their work there. I'm gonna move my talk a little bit um, into the direction of calibration services that are available from RBR. One of the questions we get um, from a lot of our users is how often do I need to calibrate um, is it done in the field? Um, is it done at RBR's lab? What do I need to do to keep my loggers uh, and sensors up to specification? And this is kind of a summary um, with regards to our compact loggers of what's uh, available from RBR in terms of calibration. So um, all of our compact loggers can be calibrated at RBR. We specifically calibrate um, temperature, pressure, and conductivity. It has an asterisk there because it's not in a compact logger form. But those are the three main parameters that are calibrated at RBR's lab. In order to maintain the factory specification for these sensors, we do recommend annual calibrations. So in general, we tell our users that you get about, um, in terms of the stability of the logger, it, it sort of changes or you get a, a drift about the level of the accuracy per year. So if the temperature sensor is two milladegrees uh, in terms of its accuracy specification, um, it is expected that it could drift um, that amount per year. So in order to maintain the spec, we would uh, recommend that you send it in for calibration once per year. Other types of sensors and parameters can be done either in our lab, um, but more often they're done uh, at, the, at our user's lab or in the field. Um, and these parameters include dissolved oxygen, turbidity, uh, chlorophyll, uh, irradiance, these things. We provide instructions uh, to help you uh, calibrate or do offsets for your sensors uh, in your own lab. You do not need to send them back to RBR for this process. Our calibration services take four weeks. Um, which is quite a fast turnaround time um, in, the, in, the, in the industry. And um, it's more than just the calibration. You get a, a, a logger check. Uh, we clean it. Um, we often get questions like, do I get a fresh battery with it? And the answer is yes. You get a fresh lithium battery with your, with your logger. Uh, we replace the O-rings. So it's really a, a refresh of your instrument and putting it back into factory working order. Another thing that people may not know about is that um, if you are purchasing new instruments from RBR, um, there is an opportunity to prepay for future calibration. So if you have capital budget that you're looking for 
uh, some instruments, uh, but you don't think you'll have operational budget um, for calibration in the future, you can buy that calibration in advance. Um, it's at a discounted price. It includes shipping, um, and it's good for two years. So you can send your instrument back to RBR within two years um, to have it calibrated, um, and that's already been included in the purchase price of your new instrument. So it's called a calibration voucher, and you're welcome to uh, ask your sales rep about that. Uh, if you're interested. And as always, you can get um, detailed quotes uh, from our support department um, by emailing support at rbrglobal.com. And finally, um, for my talk today, sometimes we help you remember that your instrument needs calibration. Um, so you don't have to keep track of it yourself. Um, I was talking to Mara earlier and she was surprised that well, that she got an email from our friendly support manager uh, with regards that her um, CTD or CT logger uh, was up for calibration. So she got this email in her inbox and it was, you know, it's up to her and, and her, and her um, logistical schedule to send it back uh, whenever she can. So that's one way we support you is we let you know. Um, another interesting thing is within uh, Ruskin software, when you plug in your instrument to Ruskin, um, it identifies the instrument. You can see the serial number. Um, but then if the instrument is beyond its recommended calibration date, an alert pops up on the calibration tab of your instrument. So as you can see on the screen here, there's an orange flag um, that says that the uh, instrument is beyond its calibration date. So these are a few friendly reminders from RBR to let you know that your instrument uh, is potentially out of spec and needs to be recalibrated. So, and we hope that helps you keep track uh, and, of your instruments and keep them uh, in perfect working order. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to, and if you have any questions, uh, you can certainly contact RBR's main office at this uh, contact info, or you're welcome to contact me uh, for West Coast um, projects. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Mara. Mm. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, when, when Dan mentioned I just received this email, I was more shocked that it had been that long since I'd purchased the instrument. You know, time flies when you're having fun. Um, okay, so hopefully, can you confirm you see the presentation mode? Is that right, Dan? Yes, so we see it perfectly and you are being recorded. Excellent, and you can see my mouse also. Yep. Okay, great. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming to listen to me today. Um, I will be talking about one of my field sites in Carmel, California. This site is called Carmel River State Beach. If you are a Google Maps user, you can also Google Mara Beach Carmel. And yes, it does come up as Mara Beach. Google has played a joke on me and named the beach after me. And it, in fact, has 40 reviews or so. Right now we're looking at the beach from the south side looking north and the main parking lot over here to the right is about 500 meters away from where I am right now. So it's a fairly small beach and you see water off to the right. This is where the river feeds into the system and it fills up this back lagoon. You see bits of marsh back on the right and off to my right here from the, the camera. And then you see all this sand and this bits of pooling of water all around. Obviously you see the ocean and lots of waves going on. And so there's a lot of interesting processes just by looking at this picture that lots of sand is moving around from time to time and very rapidly all sorts of overtopping waves enter into these periodic pools and we see this weird sort of sandbar that's building up here. And so when I came to NPS um, four years ago, I went and came to this beach on my interview and saw huge gigantic waves overtopping this entire beach and thought, wow, this is such a cool place to come and study. I bet my students are gonna love having something really tangible that they can see things rapidly evolve. And so I started studying this system. Um, and so I've been studying the system for the past four years, looking at where the water goes and how the sand moves around as a result of the sort of hydrodynamic forcing parameters. And so just to highlight you into what a bar-built estuary actually is and why I care about such a small system, what I want to talk about here are the dynamics of sort of what goes on between this balance between the ocean and the lagoon. And when you have an open lagoon, you have this sort of typical interchange between this closed back lagoon, this is protected waters, not as many waves are back here. 
the ocean is of course just open ocean or in a, in a coastal bay or wherever you happen to be situated. And it's connected between this, these two bodies of water through an inlet. And so if you're from the east coast of the United States or areas where there are barrier islands, you are very familiar with what tidal inlets are and there is regular exchange between lagoon and ocean. And then just to highlight here what the bottom profile looks like is that we have this sort of sandbar that sits perched between the lagoon and the ocean itself. Well, in California, we have a very seasonal trend to our precipitation, and these lagoons tend to be fed by rivers, which end up drying up during dry summer months. This can be seen in sort of the west coast of Europe, South Africa, Australia, so global features. And as things start to evaporate and dry up in the lagoon, you have less supply of fresh water. And because on the west coast, we have pretty significant wave energy even during the summertime, we actually end up building up this sandbar and it ends up creating this nice almost barrier beach style beach event, which you were sort of seeing from the previous picture. And so what we're seeing here, if we look down at a top view here, is that we have this nice lagoon. It's fed by some form of river and that depending on whether or not the inlet is open, we have this inlet in instances where it is closed this whole thing is closed off and you could walk all the way across and this lagoon really becomes more like a, a coastal lake. And so we have lots of different processes that might be affecting this. There's longshore sediment transport, cross-shore slosh transport. Obviously the inlet flow is going to play around with this. There's also seepage of water through the berm and wave overwash. And so you have all sorts of different processes affecting what's going on at this inlet now. And inlets are something that fascinate me. This is what I've been interested in studying. And so trying to figure out and estimate what parameters are going on inside this, this inlet itself is one of sort of my key scientific goals. And again, just to highlight in California alone, this is the west coast of the United States and a Google Earth image showing, if you look very closely, you see all the little dots underneath, only some of them are named all of the different systems in California that act as a bar-built estuary. Um, and in, in California, there's over 200 of them. And so this, this ends up being quite a um, large effect on our coastal oceans if you integrate this. Even these small little systems can play a role in sort of our overall coastal ocean um, water quality, et cetera. Um, and so just to zoom into my specific site, the picture I told you about was taken at this, at the, whoa, sorry, at, at this southern end here. If we look at Monterey Bay in general, the white box is little Carmel Bay, which is zoomed in here. And this little white box is this teeny tiny little pocket beach. You can see again, this pocket beach in its closed state is fed. We have our little lagoon here and the Carmel River which is one of the main sources of water for the Monterey Peninsula, feeds this little lagoon here. It's a site for things like endangered species such as steelhead trout. And of course, we also have uh, Clint Eastwood's Mission Ranch that's situated right on this marsh here. So we have all sorts of lovely infrastructure. Carmel is very known for its um, high property values. And so we have this interplay between flooding in this lagoon here versus protection of species that use the river for, for their habitat. Um, and so my scientific questions with this is, is it possible to predict breaching and closure events? Can I come up with a way to identify, is this beach gonna be something like this or is it gonna look more open? And then ultimately, where does the sand go? And when does migration and changing in the channel happen such that it either occupies the entire beach or it stays down towards the south. And I'll show you some pictures of that. And so when Dan asked me to give this talk, I wanted to sort of highlight some of the complexities of why would we want to deal with breaching when we have you know, such a difficulty in getting timing and access. It's not a simple question to just simply put your instruments inside the breach. And just showing two pictures here where we have a completely closed state. This was taken from the same vantage view that you saw and I described earlier. 
This is taken uh, later that day where you have this sort of overall breach channel that's very well developed. And so you go from something where it's paddle boarding and safe for sort of recreation. Lots of kids like to hang out in these lagoons back here. And then all of a sudden, a few hours later, you get this ripping channel that comes through. And so I happened to actually witness one this winter, which was really exciting to see it in action. And you can see if I'm standing here, the ocean is behind me. I'm looking towards the lagoon. You see this little shiny slick. That's the lip of the lagoon here, kind of by the paddle border. And it starts to spill over and you start to see this channel develop here. I'm looking towards the ocean and then just notice these are the times here. So 122, 129, 148. This is sort of in real time, it, you know, going through this very rapid transition. Well, by five o'clock, I've highlighted with the magenta circle here, a person just for scale. The channel is completely well developed here. It's raging like it's a river. You would never have known that this had just formed earlier that day. Um, and so one of the questions, of course, is how do you get observations in a system like this where, A, you don't know when exactly this breaching cycle is going to happen. You don't know how big it's going to be. You don't know where it's going to be. And so what I started doing just, and also here just to highlight, if you're in the active breaching channel, you can see how quickly flows are. This is real time and you see active slumping. So the channel is actively eroding. These are nice standing waves, very much a very kind of dynamic situation. These currents are going over four meters a second. And so, you know, no swimmer can swim against that, let alone trying to deploy some sort of bottom mounted instrument in here and not hoping it gets swept out. And so, lots of challenges. Um, and I mentioned migration. Migration is another challenge here. And so this is my little inset map here. This is over a seasonal perspective. And so why is it so difficult to quantify where all of this sand goes? And again, leading to the question of how are you going to try and get direct observations from this system? Note the date in the top right of all of these pictures. Keep an eye on where the ocean is. Some of these pictures are taken from the north looking south, and some of them are taken from the south looking north. Here is the channel indicated by the red arrow. And if I go forward two weeks, all of a sudden my channel has migrated all the way to the north. Where I was standing previously is on the other side of the channel. It's a very different riverine system. And then I can go back two weeks later, and now I'm looking to the north of so the oceans again off to this side. And so this channel has migrated yet again back to the south. And you can start to see this spit of sand and the old relict river channel up to the north here. This is a large amount of sand that is moving around. So again, trying to think about getting longer term observations inside a channel like this is, is not a simple question. Similarly, March 2nd, we go back to the north. And each year it changes when and how often this migration happens, why that migration happens is something that I've been trying to address and ultimately trying to instrument this system. And so this comes down to, again, if we look at a closed versus an open state, and again, the red is sort of highlighting where the river channels are, where would you try and put instruments to try and identify what's going on? And so I came up with my first uh, year, which ended up working out pretty well, three different locations where, again, I'm looking at things like pressure, I'm trying to get estimates of velocity, trying to get some CTD measurements inside the lagoon, trying to figure out how much salt water is penetrating into this lagoon, or does it stay fresh all year round? What are the currents in each of these branches of the channel? And then I realized that, well, part of that gets buried in sand, right? And so the only site that's really been successful is the one in the main channel. And I did it again. So looking at this sort of main channel site is what I'm going to show you today. I also decided it's probably a good idea to get in that some sort of an estimate of wave heights offshore. But one of my designs, again, being a lowly assistant professor starting off is I really can't afford to lose any instruments. And so my goal was to try and come up with simple mooring designs such that I wouldn't cry if I lost one given this crazy morphodynamic state. I knew that there was a pretty high risk that something was going to get buried, which in fact it did. And whether or not I could recover it later was, was definitely something I wanted to keep in mind. Um, and so again, looking if I'm now going to show you some of our offshore wave heights, this is actually taken just from the NDBC buoy. This is significant wave height versus year day. And so year day when it goes to 365 wraps into January. 
colored by directions. So again, west is really basically from the cyan direction. Anything slightly south comes from the blues. Anything from the northwest comes from the dark reds. And we look at sort of wave heights. Again, this is midwinter. And I'm showing you this period because this is the time of year in which we start to get riverine flows that happen. And so we start to see our typical breaching cycle during this, this, 10, this, 20, you know, this 20 day period here. Okay, and so I'm gonna show you several time series. If we now look at our sort of water level with the tides, you see just typical offshore tides going through a spring and neap cycle mixed semi-diurnal and diurnal. And if we go look at discharge, again, you start to see really small discharge levels that start to stay, you know, not zero, but pretty darn low if you think of discharge in meters per, or meters cubed per second less than five. And then this giant peak when we get significant rainfall. And I've purposely kept it so you can't see the whole peak because I wanted to focus in on this sort of overall trend here. And this plays into account when you start to look at the water levels that I measured inside the lagoon itself. And so this blue line here represents our water level in the, the lagoon. This is surveyed to NAVD 88. And so yes, it is always higher than the ocean tide. We call this system a perched system because of that, meaning that there's always an offshore pressure gradient and that offshore pressure gradient should drive some sort of an offshore directed flow. So keep that in mind, I'll bring that up again. And so if we look at this all together, we can look at two different locations inside the lagoon in terms of what our water levels look like. See, there is some variability, especially on the low tide. If you're closer to the channel, you end up getting a slightly lower low tide than if you're further up in the channel. Makes sense. And I can identify different locations. These are seven different breaching and closure events where the green uh, indicates our, our breaching events when, when the river starts to open, indicated by a rapid drop in water elevation. The orange indicates a closure event where all of a sudden they start to deviate from any tidal signature. And if you notice all of these, all of these different orange circles and green circles, they happen all within a sort of a two week period. And that it actually ends up being that there's no correlation between when the breaching happens and offshore waves versus what tidal stage this is. And this is only seven data points. So maybe that's not the full story. But it was interesting to me that all of the closures happened on a closing um, and rising and or rising high tide. And so all of these closures here are indicated right at sort of this high tide level here indicated by high water levels in the ocean. After this initial sort of transition period when the discharge starts to get really large, you have this completely open system where it stays tidal and um, stays, stays sort of connected to the ocean for, for quite a few months. And so if we were to zoom in on two closure events in particular, and one of the reasons why I was really pleased with, with using the sort of compact RBR sensors was I could still sample at two hertz. So I could get any sort of percolation into the system of surface gravity waves, which are marked by this sort of increase in the variance of my water level signature here. And so I can look at that and say, hey, I'm seeing this trend where every time I see a closure, these two events were two, two distinct closure events, I start to see this increased uh, variance in my water level. If I looked at my spectral density, what this starts to look like is I'm actually getting a lot of lower frequency. This frequency is in Hertz, so this 0 0.05 is starting to look more like infragravity waves as opposed to swell, which would be more on the 10 second or the 0.1 Hertz. Realm and so what we're what we're seeing is this sort of intermittent bursting of energy into the system more on the infragravity wave energy um, frequency uh, range, and so that was really interesting to to note that we could sort of start to to notice that at every time something at every time this estuary closed we had a lot of wave energy and a lot of um, a lot of you know sort of tidal you know the high, the tide was on a high tide stage as it as it was closing and so one of my first students was looking at what was the driving factors here we had obviously river discharge dri uh, driven by rain we have waves in the system and then we also have tides it's been known obviously that there is seepage through these types of beaches especially when the lagoon is perched and so how much does this play a role i leave that as a question mark i have not yet 
Um, I have not yet addressed some of those questions with regards to seepage. And so you can set up a simple momentum balance. And I say simple because it really is quite idealized here where you're looking at these etas, which are our water levels. We're looking at discharge, which is whatever's going through this tidal inlet system. And we're looking at wave radiation stress gradients here. And so we have our wave radiation stress, our pressure gradient here with respect to differences in water level between the lagoon and the ocean. And then we have a discharge or a dynamic pressure that's fed by the river itself here too. And so one thing that you can do with this is you can play around with based off of our sort of upstream conditions, our offshore waves and our river discharge, you can play around and our tides, you can play around with how these different forcing parameters inside that momentum balance play a role here. So just to highlight you again, you've seen these water level plots. These are water level versus year day. Red are again the tides. Black is again what's in the lagoon here. And now down below, I see the momentum balance. And this is a, a bit confusing, so I'm gonna try and define the signs here. The black is what is coming from the river. And so it is positive offshore whereas the blue and the red are from the ocean and they are positive onshore. And so that sign convention, if these two different, uh, if these two different curves are the same, it means they're equal and opposite and you have pushing from the ocean equaling an opposite direction from the discharge from the river. And I did that just because it's visually kind of easier to see that if I just look at tides, again, just the tidal forcing coming from this tide in the ocean, you'll see as expected that there's always going to be some offshore directed pressure gradient. And that should always be offshore directed. It should never close up. You should never see a system that's based purely on discharge and tidal pressure, or tidal um, water level gradients that would ever close. And so instead, when you include the wave radiation stress, and here we have the wave radiation stress acting against the river discharge and the pressure gradient force, you actually end up seeing that there's enough dissipation of energy at the mouth that accounts for the fact that you can actually have some closures. And so again, when the blue equals the black, you have significant forcing from the ocean that is causing enough uh, energy to settle out. Okay. And so just from a simple um, you know, mini summary here, my breach closure, closure prediction, breaches were not correlated with tide stage and wave height. This was very much driven by the riverine processes and how full the lagoon was and when it was going to overtop dependent on sort of the overall beach berm height. This is something I haven't necessarily talked about in this particular talk. But that onshore directed wave forcing, this really was a critical factor when looking at a momentum balance inside the channel itself, such that if you had this wave forcing, you could have equal and opposite uh, forces such that you can have channels that are, um, that are allowing for sort of sedimentation inside this, this tidal inlet. And so that ultimately leads me to the, the fact that closures are related with maxima in the ocean with that sort of tides and waves forcing. So we've looked at this over other seasons and definitely seen the fact that waves have to be bigger than a certain amount for it to actually close up. And that's again, gonna be driven by whatever discharge you have in the river. And so just to segue briefly into sort of the morphology component and again, trying to tease out where sand is going, I'm gonna highlight sort of with yellow arrows here and months in sort of white writing here, two different years, one that was wet with high river discharge and one that was dry with low river discharge. And these are all aerial images taken from roughly the same vantage point of the system. And when the breach is active, it's indicated by this sort of yellow arrow here. And so what you can see is that during wet winters, you see migration of this channel, you end up getting this channel migrating all the way to the north. Whereas in dry winters, you really have just the river sort of maintaining this sort of southerly exposure here. So one of the questions was why was that going on? And again, looking, if we just look at time series now of wave height, we have discharge, we have lagoon water level, and then precipitation, I can highlight to you when we have our sort of active periods of 
big discharge. Here, the black lines indicate the breach orientation. So south means towards the south, central is in the middle, and then north. And you can see that a lot of these sort of central and north are followed right by this large period of river discharge. If I fast forward to the next season, where it's again the same, where the top is wave height, discharge, lagoon, and precipitation, you don't see nearly as much discharge. And these are on the same vertical scales just for ease of view. And so really we did have a few little teeny tiny blips, but it was nothing like the year before. Similarly, waves are, 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 are big, but they weren't as big as in the last season. And so you can see a lot more intermittency here and everything's staying towards the south just from, from the offshore perspective. Um, yep, sorry. Um, and so what I've been doing also, and, and, and I may end here just to, to um, spark conversation, has been looking at sort of the structure for motion using simple drones. Nothing with the Navy is simple about using drones. And so this has been an ongoing effort to try and just get permission to fly these things. Um, and doing bathymetry with, um, you know, trying to get estimates of sort of what the bathymetry in the lagoon are like. And I'll leave this with here saying that during our sort of seasonal variations with this wet year, you see the sort of net loss of sediment to, to the system, which is this blue loss here, sort of negative. This is an elevation difference between the sort of all the morphological evolutions. So where you see this blue, you have a loss from a system. And then during the dry year, you see the opposite where it's more red and the red indicates this sort of net gain. And I highlight this sort of main area here because again, this was where the relic channel was from a wet year. This is the next year where it's definitely filled itself in. Um, and so again, just to summarize here, during low discharge years, we did not see migration. We, shot, we, we definitely saw that there was this onshore sediment transport in the overall beach structure itself. But during high discharge years, you had this migration to the north definitely had some sort of uh, processes going on, which we're still trying to address in terms of what's actually going on with that. And so with that, you know, again, overall conclusions, we can play with all sorts of different instrumentation techniques to try and tease out what's going on inside this channel. Definitely not an easy problem, but it's definitely fun to get out there and try and solve it. So with that, I'll thank you and take any questions. Thank you, Mara. That was really, really good. I really appreciated that. And I, I'm sure it was really interesting to our audience as well. Uh, we'd like to open it up. Does anybody um, have any questions uh, for Mara or for myself? And I've got some if they don't, but we'll give them just a second to think about it. Hi. It's yes, go ahead. Oops. Oh, I just realized I got. Uh, here, this is me, uh, it's Patrick Potter. I'm talking to you from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, and uh, enjoyed the, uh, the talk, Mara, thank you. Um, yeah. We've been looking at a, uh, a, a system uh, close by that's uh, similar but different, um, a lagoon uh, without a river behind it, a much coarser, um, um, grain beach, uh, gravel cobble beach, though there's some sand there. Um, and we've seen periodic breachings. Uh, it's, um, but it breached last year and, and has not repaired. Um, and so, yeah, completely different system. So the contrast is, is interesting. Uh, lots of questions. It seems like very um, uh, fun grained sand. I guess the thing that I was wondering is if, if you've looked at or if you've thought about uh, in these wetter years when uh, when there's more flow coming down uh, and that uh, migration to the north, I guess, uh, have you thought about bedrock control of subsurface if that's um, with greater flow, uh, down cutting more and, and finding a, a happier route through to the north or um yeah that's a um, that's a yeah, good question have you, have you thought? yeah so um down to the south here is definitely driven by this headland that is rocky and it, it gets exposed very quickly 
Um, and so you can start to see maybe some of these little rocks inside this channel here. Um, and so it erodes down to the bedrock almost completely, which is about 20 meters down from the main sort of mean sea level. Um, and that, I think that, again, think because I don't actually have the bedrock structure for this particular area. That's something that I have been trying to find. Um, but I think it's fairly consistent that it's about 20 meters down throughout the entire beach, but that it starts to get rocky again towards the north. And so from, from that perspective, definitely have the lateral bounds on the beach itself. And that's why it doesn't cut to the, much further south than sort of this extent that we see here. Um, and why it goes north, yeah, I don't, I don't think it is bedrock driven. I definitely think that, in, you know, it, it's definitely limited in how far south it can migrate by bedrock. But in terms of north, I think what, what ends up happening, and I didn't have a chance to show it, was the fact that the offshore waves have a very subtle directional change sometimes. And that ends up creating sort of an alongshore um, gradient in, in radiation stress. And I think it turns the river plume when we have the plume that enters into the ocean. And so I think it's that deflection of the plume that sort of gets this feedback going, that has it, has it going towards the north. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the from the audience? Mara, I, I have um, another one. Oh, do we have another <laughs> one, Patrick? Well, uh, I'm. Uh, I work as a geophysicist here, but uh, my background is also in civil engineering, and uh, I saw uh, your video of the uh, of the brief it uh, it looked like supercritical flow oh definitely uh, and wondered if where you saw the the difference in the, your two gauges the one uh, further seaward was lower down if you were seeing yeah uh, if some of that um, elevation difference was uh, due to a drawdown from subcritical upriver to supercritical down um yeah down Good closer question. to uh well seaward yeah no that that's a great question too um i don't know if i can answer that definitively but where my gauge is relative to this hydraulic control it's way upstream and way offshore and part of that was for exactly that i didn't want to get too too close to this crazy um uh, I mean, just A, I don't want to lose instruments, and then B, it was, you know, this, this surface of this water is clearly not flat. If you watch it spill over and you watch from the lagoon side, it's really cool because you can just sort of see it spilling over into the channel itself as it's starting to, um, as it's starting to breach. And so you can really see that transition from subcritical in the lagoon into sort of the more supercritical spillover. Um, so I think where where my instruments are upstream is way outside that realm, um, and I don't think it's affected by the overall transition. I, I would be really curious to look at that more, though, because I think that's very interesting. Mara, if I were to ask my question, um, it, it sounds like you did a really great job of instrumenting um, this research site on a budget. Um, with with very few instruments. And my question is, does that introduce sort of error given the variability of these channels that you mentioned? Does that introduce error and how do you account for that um, if you just got one sort of point reference or I know you have multiple, but um, if you have very few um, instrumented points, how does that affect the, your numbers when you're coming out uh, of this research? Yeah, great question. So I think some of the things, some of the areas where I have the biggest uncertainty, um, especially when I think about that momentum balance, are I don't really know the very precise dimensions of the breach channel, and presumably that changes. Um, and so that that is sort of an unknown where I can go with sort of end member guesses and look at sort of sensitivity to these types of variables. But like you say, if I don't have anything that's in the channel itself. And some of it's sort of, you know, best estimates and, and, and that's all you can do. 
I think with respect to looking at the overall water levels, though, just in terms of the analysis between looking at these three different sensors and whatnot, having one out there is so much better than than none that I think it's worth you know just having that 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 single instrument. Um, now, of course, if I were if I were to all of a sudden inherit a bunch of instruments and have sort of disposable funds, I would keep a lot more uh, out there. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, I'm really curious now about the um, the water quality aspect. So, looking more at the salinity and how that percolates through and how that evolves in the system over sort of the seasonality and going through that and dissolved oxygen as well. That's something else that I have a, a student who's been working on. Um, so yes, definitely, um, you know, I, I would still argue that having some instruments out there um, that, that gives you such a better clue to what's going on than, than nothing. And I, you know, I'd go back to actually one of the, the things that I did not mention that was even trickier about this site is even if you can find a site that doesn't change and isn't gonna sweep your instruments out to sea, there are tons and tons of people who go to the site and I have had so many people try and, you know, either through, you know, Good Samaritan try and cut my line to all of my, you know, instruments and they think it's trash or something's out there despite clear labels and things like this. I've had people try and use it as ring toss for, you know, whatever. Um, and so finally I've resorted to using jacketed wire rope and a pretty heavy weight so people don't mess with it. Mm -hmm. But again, yeah. So hope that answers that, Dan. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've got one more question, but I'll give a bit of space to anybody else who'd like to uh, join. Okay, maybe one last question from me, and then um, and then we'll conclude. But Mara, can you tell us? You mentioned at the beginning of your talk, you talked about um, the predictive nature of of some of your research questions, like oh, how can we tell if if and when and where um these systems are going to breach or close up and i'm wondering um where you are with that like or i guess my question is sort of what are some of the ways that you're, you're thinking how the predictions might work um and then who might be interested in these predictions um great question also so in terms of the predictions i think a lot of that is is like when the first breach is going to happen is always the big question and who cares about this particular system is monterey county they um, are actively responsible for preventing flooding to the back neighborhood area and so if they if the beach firm gets too high they start to get really worried because that can fill the lagoon even higher mm -hmm. and so they want to know when is the river going to start flowing enough that that's a bigger question. I have no idea how to answer when the river starts flowing. That's more on the precipitation side. But I think once it starts flowing, you can get an estimate for how quickly, um, you know, how quickly the lagoon is going to fill up that sort of overall hypsometry doesn't change too much over, over time. Um, and so I think you can have, you know, a good estimate for how quickly once the river starts to flow, how quickly that will fill up. You can also have good estimates for sort of the beach berm and how quickly that's going to grow. It, once it stabilizes in the summertime, it sort of doesn't change much. And so you may have that initial seasonal change. So predicting that initial breach then just becomes a question of how much water is flowing into the lagoon. As for the subsequent breaching enclosure, one of the things that, that um, I've been working on is trying to come up with sort of this index value for you know the county to say hey if you have offshore wave heights from this direction um and in this manner how is that going to compound with whatever tidal cycle we're on if whether it's spring or neap and if i dredge this channel now is this going to be a you know Im you know something that impacts whether or not it stays open or closed um, similarly if it breaches on its own will it stay open or closed well thank you very much um I think that takes us to the end of the hour. And so I'm going to just conclude this webinar right now. Um, but Mara, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and for joining RBR today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan, for having me. Okay, I'm going to start, re start recording. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.